Good morning. Let's stand this morning as, as, as people are coming in. They'll join us. We're going to join our voices this morning and just give all the glory and honor and praise to our Lord and Savior. It is a beautiful day. It is a, it is a beautiful day to be together. I love the fall kind of harvest decorations that are starting even at our, our table, our refreshment table. It really is a gorgeous, gorgeous time. So blessed to be together. What are you turned into? Why? Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. None like you. Into the darkness. I love that we have our youth up there dancing in the balcony. You all can't see it, but trust us, it's amazing. <clears throat> we love dance and we love everyone just to celebrate in whatever way it is that you're celebrating the love of God in our lives. And this next song, we ask you to really quiet your, your minds and open your hearts to this message of this song. And as always, there's a message. Don't let it pass you by. And this is a good one this morning.
Our God is present in the storms. Our God is a refuge and strength in times of trouble, and we know that, we've experienced that, and it is now going to be our opportunity in the coming days and weeks, along with other people of faith across this country, to be able to express that in the lives of people in tangible, meaningful ways, where they will come to know the love and the grace and the healing help of God through people like us. Welcome to Imagine Church. We're so honored to have you here this morning. What a great day this is in the name of the Lord, and we thank you for taking time out of a busy schedule uh, to be here with us and to attend to the things of God. We just want you to know that whoever you are and wherever you are in your faith journey, there's a place for you here with us. I'm Bruce Jones, and it's my privilege to be pastor and one of the co-creators of Imagine Church, and just to watch how God has been at work in this new faith community and the way God has touched and transformed lives. And we're so grateful to each of you who has become a part of this new community of faith and what God is doing in and through you. Thank you to all of our guests who are here with us today. We welcome you to Imagine Church. Hello to everybody in the balcony. We're glad you all are here this morning. Um, We have two levels of worshipers in Imagine Church on Sundays, and we're so glad that you're here. Our prayers are with our sisters and brothers across this nation and in the Caribbean, in Mexico, and the states out west. And those who have been affected by the recent storms, our thoughts and prayers are with them, and we're going to talk about ways that we can be of help to them in just uh, a few moments. Let's bow our heads and begin with prayer. May we pray together. Gracious and eternal God, we offer to you today and to your loving care all whose lives have been changed forever by the recent natural disasters. And we pray that you would comfort the victims of the wildfires out in the western states, that you would pour out your mercy and blessing on our sisters and brothers in the Caribbean who are facing the devastation of the storms, that you'd protect all those who have had to evacuate communities, who have had to seek shelter in the path of Hurricane Irma, those who have been affected by the earthquake in Mexico in their trials. We pray that you would strengthen all who are engaged in the recent recovery efforts following Hurricane Harvey and those beginning the long process of rebuilding their lives. God, we pray that they would know that we stand with them, but not only we, because we know that the Lord who sacrificed his life for us and was raised from the dead is with them as well. May they know that we are their brothers and sisters and that we are all in this together. And we pray, O God, that our benediction for them would be, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace this day and forevermore. In the name of our Savior and Lord, we pray. And all of us together said, Amen. I know there are a number of ways that you can help those who are suffering and those who have been affected by the recent natural disasters. But one good way that we use at Imagine Church is called Church World Service. And if you want to make a contribution in any amount in addition to your regular offering to help with with hurricane relief, just mark it so on your gift, on your envelope, or on your check, and we will direct that to Church World Service. The thing we love about Church World Service is 100 cents of every dollar that's contributed goes directly to those who are in need. Another thing that we're going to do, many of you are aware that our daughter, Lauren, uh, who with her husband Bo and their children, Elena and Otis, reside in, on the island of St. John in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Their home was spared. They have a really well-built home. But the houses of so many of their neighbors and friends were destroyed. And so many of the venues where Lauren would sing are no longer there. It's going to be a long time before even their livelihood is restored. They are actually with Bo's parents now out in Colorado. And Lauren is beginning to do a series of, of musical concerts as benefits where she's not making anything from it. But all of the proceeds raised will go to St. John Rescue, a relief, relief effort on the island of St. John because so many of their neighbors and friends over the 10 years they've been there have been affected. I've invited Lauren to do a benefit concert here at Imagine Church on probably Sunday evening, October 15th. We're still working out the calendar. It looks like that will be the day. There'll be no charge for the concert. They will have some CDs available that uh, you might want to consider purchasing. But there will be an offering that evening for us to be able to make a generous contribution toward the relief efforts there on the island of St. John. And there's a lot of help going to Florida. I know they need help, a lot of help going to other places in the country. But but the Virgin Islands have have been um, not really forgotten, but they're just not receiving as much help. But we're going to do something that will be able to be of help. And so just keep that in mind. And and, uh, I'll confirm the date in our newsletter that goes out on Thursday, but we're looking at October 15th, that Sunday evening, a benefit concert. If you, I know I'm, I'm a little bit biased now and I'm talking as a daddy, but if you ever heard Lauren Jones Magney sing, you'll want to be here for that concert. She really is quite good. Got all of her musical talent from me? No, that's not the case. But I think you will be blessed by that concert. And, and as you consider that and consider your, your gift to that relief effort, 
uh, keep in mind also others that are suffering in Florida and Texas and other places uh, who need our help and need the prayer and the care of Christian people around the country. Let you watch this. Someday when we're in heaven and we have the privilege of meeting our Lord and he says, I remember that time when you helped me when I survived the storm and we might say, Lord, we never helped you in a storm and Jesus might say, oh yes, you did because I was in those, I was in those men and women and those boys and girls that you helped in their time of most acute need. When you've done it unto one of the least of these, my sisters and brothers, Jesus said, it's as if you've done it for me. Keep that in mind as we uh, pray about how we can help and serve in the coming days and weeks. We have so many exciting things happening in the life of our faith community. We're going to share a, a couple of those this morning. I want to invite Martha Edwards, if she will come up, representing our adult life group. And also, uh, Carrie DiDonato, who's our missions person on a leadership team. I want Carrie to come up as well. And we're going to hear from both of them back to back as they share a little bit of some of the exciting things happening in the life of our church here at Imagine. Thank you, Martha, and thank you, Carrie. Finally, we're about to get on the boat. Next week, we have 19 adults going to Lake Norman, and we'll be getting on the boat. We'll be meeting at Bojangles at 845. So we're real excited on one thing that we need. Any guess? You're quiet. Good weather. <laughs> so say that in your prayers this week. Also, set up on your calendars October 26th. It's a Thursday. We're all going to be attending the Chinese Lantern Festival. So I'm sure you've heard a lot about it. There's been a lot of advertisements, over 800 lanterns. Uh, it will be a wonderful time for us to go together as a group. You will buy your tickets yourselves, either at the door or online. And for those that want early dinner, I'll be setting up a dinner where we can meet and talk, and from there we'll go to... Daniel Stowe Botanical Gardens. So please set that on your calendar. I have one good advertisement about it. I was talking to one teenager last week, and she said, it's cool. <laughs> so that's a good indicator that all people will like it, no matter what your age. So please attend with us. You'll see us every week out front with our board, so if you have an interest, please talk to me or Randy. I'm going to end with one thing I read this morning. Any of you get living here? Came out this morning in my paper, and when I read one article, it reminded me of our church. And it was talking about four real estate trends to watch in 2018. 
It does apply to church too. It says urban and suburban collide. And it talked about how uptown you have a lot of walkability, you can get around real easy. But the thing that lacks is human connection. The last paragraph says, when you walk down the neighborhood street in the suburbs, you get to meet and greet people who then become a part of your life. The same sense of community is such a big draw. That speaks to our church too. Let's all come get together at the gardens and let's get to know each other. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. We're just one week away from our Mission Sunday. That'll be next Sunday, September 24th. Um, immediately following service, we'll go down to room 122. And um, I don't know if anybody saw the image that was included in this week's uh, newsletter, but it represented all of the items that we had collected thus far. For over the last month or so, we've been collecting the items that you so generously have been bringing in. Um, and I had taken a picture and it represented 60 glue sticks, 76 boxes of crayons, 335 eraser caps, 42 pairs of scissors, 22 pencil sharpeners, 156 pens, 446 pencils, 39 notebooks, and a countless supply of uh, gently used lunch boxes and backpacks. And it was just such a beautiful sight to see all of those piled up on my table. Um, and more have come in today. So we're just so appreciative for your generous hearts, um, both from the, the tangible things that you've brought in, and some of you have made monetary donations over the last few weeks. That money will also be used to purchase some of the supplies that we need to fill in some of the gaps and to cover some of our shipping costs to ship those supplies overseas. But we're just looking forward to um, everyone participating next week. Um, just come down to 122, spend a few minutes using your hands and your hearts to package up those plastic school supply boxes, and we're gonna send those overseas to where they're uh, desperately needed. So thank you very much. We're so grateful to people like Martha and Carrie who give so much of themselves in the work of Christ uh, through this faith community. Thank you both for all that you do and for the way that you honor God with your lives and your service. Carrie's parents-in-law are here visiting with us today from Ohio. I know they have to be as proud of her as, as we are, and we're glad you all are with us today. Well, someone else that we're mighty proud of, um, you know that back in April, David White, a, a part of the Imagine Church family, was ordained into Christian ministry, and he has carved out a rather exciting niche in the way he serves God through his ordination. I've asked him to share just a, a word about that. David, come up and share with people what you've been doing in the name of Christ with your ordination since back in April, and we thank you. Good football Sunday. <laughs> uh, well, since being ordained back in April, I've taken several interesting paths that were kind of unexpected. I put my name out on Wedding Wire thinking I could do one or two weddings a year. That'd be kind of fun. It's, weddings are great. You get to help people start their lives together. And um, that one or two turned into one or two a week. So outside of this weekend, but I met, where I ended up meeting with couples to plan their weddings about every weekend since this first weekend of August all the way into next year, I have one or two weddings to perform every week with people that are right on that cusp of, we really want a religious wedding, we really want God with us, but we don't belong to a church, or our church has said we can't be married here because we already live together. So I have this very interesting group of people that I've been doing weddings for everywhere from, um, I think I'm in China Grove, North Carolina next year, and I'm going to be down somewhere in um, Sharon, South Carolina. It's a city with, with I've been told it's got a Walmart, a Lowe's, and a post office, so I'll get to see that town. <laughs> um, outside of that, this coming Wednesday, I get to go to Juvenile Hall, so I'm going to jail, but with a bunch of much younger people um, to get introduced into a group called Epiphany, which is the... It's a version of the Emmaus Weekend. Uh, it's based on Kairos, which is what's done for adults in jail, but it's for youth that are currently incarcerated up at um, Stonewall Jackson in Concord. So those are the two big things I've been working on since being ordained. David, we're proud of you for the way you honor God with your call and 
the way you have responded to God's call in your life. Well, I don't ever really travel much, and Tyra will tell you it's hard to get me to take a vacation, but I'm going to be traveling this week, Tuesday of this week. Phil Griffin and I have been invited by Chuck Spencer. You all know Chuck and Rose Spencer, who are part of our church family. They live in Palisades, but they have a summer vacation home in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. I just last week learned where Idaho is on the map, and now I'm going to get to go there. But we fly out on Tuesday. We fly to Salt Lake City and then to Coeur d'Alene. We're going to hike and explore and visit Montana and Oregon and just see as much as we can. I'll be back Friday night, so we'll be back here at church next Sunday. But uh, just wanted to share with you what Phil and I are doing. And then later next week, I think Chuck is coming back home, and he'll be back at church in a couple weeks. But keep us in your prayers as we travel and go visit a part of the country that I've never seen before and look forward to that. I uh, want to ask you to keep in your prayers as well. Tyra's sister-in-law, Kim Callahan, is in the hospital at Baptist Medical Center in Winston-Salem and needs our prayers. Her prognosis is not good. Kim's young, has two daughters, married to uh, Tyra's brother, Tim, and we just ask for your prayers for them. In just a few minutes after we uh, dismiss our boys and girls and our Imagination Youth are going to have a session this morning, uh, we're going to begin a brand new series today, and it's called the Family Series. It's one I've been looking forward to for a long time, and it's going to go for the next three weeks as we talk about parenting and, and childrening and just what it means to live in a family. Uh, they don't have to be perfect. In fact, none of them are perfect. But we're going to enjoy talking about family together and what the Bible teaches us about how we live together as families. I'm going to invite you in just a moment to stand and greet each other in the name of the Lord as you, as you share a greeting. We're going to dismiss our boys and girls. They go down the hall this way to 122 B and C and also room 103. And our leaders will be down there to greet them. And our Imagination Youth will also be leaving. They'll be going to room 122A for their session this morning. And as they do that, let me invite you to stand and just share the love of Christ with each other with a holy hug or kiss. Welcome each other to church this morning. You actually be seated and use this time as reflection. We welcome you to sing with us, but you may be seated at this time. Is this thing on? Hello. <laughs> and just let these words wash over you. There's so much going on in the world. Natural disaster man-made disaster what is going on in your world you need to quiet quiet your minds and open your hearts and know that God is there so you may be seated and if you feel led to sing the words are on the screen and guess what if you want to stand that's fine too wherever you are led which is what this song is all about where are you led this morning you call Great unknown, where feet may fall, and there I find you in the mystery in oceans deep. My faith will stand, and I will call upon. My soul will rest in your embrace, for I am yours, and you are mine. Let these words just wash over you and meet you right where you are, right now in your life. Your grace abounds in deepest waters. Your sovereign hand will be my guide. Where feet may 
fail and fear surrounds me you never fail and you won't start now and I will call upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves when oceans rise my soul Jennifer and Ben, thank you so much for the music today and for all you do that just leads us in to the presence of the Lord in this place. How many of you were here last Sunday? Just raise your hand if you were, because you were able to be a part of something that I've never experienced before in my life and ministry, and I've been doing this for a long time, but it's just amazing to watch how God works within the, the life of a community of faith, the body of believers, but also how God works within the lives of of an individual couple. And uh, back a few weeks ago, Tom and Danielle Bauer had come to me with uh, a desire to do something, uh, to, just to express their, their gratitude to God for what God has done in their lives and in their business. But they wanted to do it through Imagine Church. And um, Danielle is here today. Raise your hand, Danielle. Just, I don't want to embarrass you, but I just want people to know who you are if you were not here last week. But they uh, announced last week a gift for the future development of Imagine Church of $1,250,000. Isn't that extraordinary? It just is amazing how God works. That deserves another round of applause, I think. It just does. <laughs> and we're not yet sure um, what God's going to lead us to do with that, but God's going to make that clear too, and, and we're working on that. And I look forward to being able to talk more about that with you in weeks to come. But Danielle, we're just so touched and blessed by the way that God has moved in your life and in Tom's life that led you to make this extraordinary gift, really not just to God's people, but to the Lord, uh, to give thanks back to God for the way God has, has blessed you. And I don't, again, I don't want to embarrass her, but I mentioned to her this week how touched I was when everybody stood and applauded as they were going back to their seats. And Danielle said, I had tears in my eyes because I love my church family so much. That just shows how God is at work in one's heart. And Danielle, we're proud of you for that and grateful to you and Tom so much. Well, I'm excited about our new series. It's called the Family Series, and I'm going to be as honest as I can today. The message you'll learn in a few minutes is called Confessions of an Imperfect Dad, and that is me. I don't qualify for any other uh, adjective other than imperfect, but I look forward to sharing this message with you, and I've asked Mike Winson to share God's Word this morning. No one does more uh, here than Mike, he, both for the seminary and also for Imagine Church. He's in our praise band, and he um, gives so much of himself to service to God. He's also the media services manager here at the seminary. Mike is going to be our lay reader today. Mike, would you share God's word and lead us into the message with your prayer? And we thank you. Morning. <clears throat> Today's scripture readings from the book of Genesis, 
chapter 49, verses 1, 2, and verse 26. Out of reverence for our Lord Jesus Christ, would you please stand for the reading of God's word. Then Jacob called for his sons and said, Gather around so I can tell you what will happen to you in the days to come. Assemble and listen, sons of Jacob. Listen to your father Israel. Your father's blessings are greater than the blessings of the ancient mountains, than the bounty of the age-old hills. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for uh, Imagine Church, for a place that we can fellowship and be together, Lord. We pray that uh, as Pastor Bruce comes up and speaks, that uh, his words will be your words and that our ears will be open to hearing them and understanding them. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We've just been so wrapped up with the kids and the renovations and our jobs. We've. Yeah, you know. Why would I order a toilet Mom. to sit in the center of my bathroom and just do nothing? Mom. It doesn't look particularly pretty. Mom. Hey, what do you want? Where's my lunch? It's a meatloaf sandwich. Why did you give me meatloaf? Here you go, honey. Put that in your bathroom. Honey, I need a clean shirt. Uh -huh. I couldn't well, find my clean shirt. I can't be hey. here tomorrow at 4 o'clock. I need a clean it's shirt. today. You get hired Son. to come to a person's house and fix their toilet. Well, now it's wrinkled. Yes, I'll hold. Uh, we are <laughs> trying to establish a date night, you know, just um, a night, just me and Carl, no kids, uh, just to reconnect and reestablish why we got married in the first place. Yeah, and I thought it would be really fun for one of us to plan the entire date for the other one, you know, to incorporate the element of surprise. Hey, John. No, paintball. She forgot. Come on, honey. We're gonna be late. Hold your horses, partner. We're not going line dancing, are we? <clears throat> so, uh, maybe this surprise thing needs some tweaking, uh, but... Dressed like an idiot or not, I got to spend the evening with an amazing woman. Aww. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's a date night, so Rome wasn't built in a day. 400 years. <laughs> hey, Joshua, this is Lauren. And your big brother, Jonathan. We wanted to share a little bit of wisdom with you from our years living with Dad. First of all, there are some perks to being a preacher's kid, like getting to eat leftover bread and grape juice from Communion Sunday. And people pretty much expect you to misbehave a little bit. But beware, because any embarrassing moment could become prime sermon material. Hey, Josh, I know you like cars. But one thing Dad doesn't like is for you to make a racetrack for your Matchbox cars on the hood of his car. If you need something fun to do during the sermon, I recommend going into Dad's office and rearranging a few items on his desk. Then after church is over, watch to see how fast he's able to locate every displaced item and return it to its rightful home. It should take about 10 seconds. He'll feed you donuts all the time. Today will make your tummy sick. Maybe you should eat what Mommy feeds. I don't know if you know this, but if you don't rinse out your cereal bowl after you finish eating, then the cereal dries to the side of the bowl, and someone has to scrape it off the bowl with their fingernails. Dad is much easier to get along with if he does not have cereal under his nails. One thing about Dad, when you play with your race car, he is an awesome announcer. And, uh... Thanks to Big Brother Jonathan, you can pretty much be as wild as you want during your teenage years and not surprise Dad at all. Don't let Dad tell you how to wear your socks. They don't have to be pulled up to your knees. If he ever gives you a spanking, just cry really hard and say, I can't believe you hit me. 
He'll let you hit him back. It'll never happen again. One thing Dad does know, good sports team, the Duke Blue Devils and the Carolina Panthers. When you're old enough to drive, don't worry if you forget important things like wearing your seatbelt or locking your doors because Dad will remind you every time you get in the car, forever. Now, Dad, he loves it when you make your room as messy as you can and as often as you can. The madder he gets, the more he loves you. <laughs> and lastly, he waited a long time for you to be in his life, so you don't ever have to worry about him taking you or Mommy for granted. You've pretty much got him in the palm of your hand. Now, I've got to tell you, I need some time for rebuttal, I guess, because... That time that Jonathan took his matchbox cars out of the sandbox and drove them all over the hood of my car, and I said, Jonathan, how could you have done that? Lauren looked at me and she said, Dad, it's just a car. That was the wrong answer, I'll tell you that. <laughs> but there are a lot of ways, as you just heard, that Lauren and Jonathan and now Joshua can tell you that I've blown it as a dad or at least was not the perfect father who was always calm and peaceful. And I want you to notice as we begin the message today, and as we begin this thing called the family series, it's not advice from the best dad in the world. It is called Confessions of an Imperfect Dad. I'm not sure where dad happened, where dad went on that uh, screen, but you know what? An imperfect pastor too, I guess. But what I'd like to try to offer today at least is 30 plus years of, of perspective on fathering. And I think maybe together with you to confess some of the places where I always didn't get it right. And what I might have learned from that and what you might learn from it. And so what we're going to do this morning is talk for a few minutes about fathering. And the next week we're going to talk about mothering. And I'll again give you another confession. That is I've, I've never been a mother. And so we're going to have four women. We're going to have a panel up here that I'm going to interview. And they're going to talk about mothering. Uh, one of whom is empty nester. The other three have children at home. And then on Sunday, October 1st, we're going to talk about what our parents who are older have taught us about childrening and about what we can expect as we continue to age. And so that's where this whole series is going over three Sundays. But I do want to mention something right up front. Today, when we talk about fathering, I want you to listen to this sermon on two levels. I want you to listen to what I'm saying about dads and moms and aunts and uncles and grandparents and, and people who invest in the lives of children. But then I want you to think about what does the message say about our relationship with our Heavenly Father? What does it teach us about God and us, not just about dads and children, okay? And what I want to begin with this morning is to remind you of a very important biblical idea, which is blessings and curses. In the Bible, this is a really big idea. You remember God said to Abraham, He said, I will bless you so that you will be a blessing, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed through you. But what is a blessing? Well, a blessing is goodness poured into our lives. It's positive things to happen in our lives. It's goodness poured into us. That's a blessing. It's to wish for or to give something good to someone else. It's a state of blessedness. Now, there are also curses. And to be cursed is to be in a state where your life is not enriched but diminished. Where instead of good things, you're experiencing bad things. And there's this idea in the Bible that parents pass on blessings or curses to their children, potentially. And in the book of, of Genesis, you find several stories of deathbed blessings, of patriarchs passing on blessings to their children before the patriarch dies. The most fascinating one to me is that of Jacob. And in Genesis chapter 49, Jacob is on his deathbed, and he brings all of his sons in to stand around the bed. There are 12 sons there. And he begins to bless his sons. But what's fascinating is that the words he gives to some of his sons are more like curses instead of blessings. He talks about what he sees in them. And for a few, his words are harsh, and they're even hurtful. And he sets those children's lives on a trajectory that, that realizes the curse that Jacob gave them. But with the other sons, he gives them positive blessings, wishing wonderful things and foretelling a tremendous future for them, including his favorite, who's Joseph. 
And Joseph receives this great blessing from his father Jacob. Now at the end of giving those blessings, we read the scripture that Mike has before us this morning, where Jacob says to Joseph, the blessings of your father are greater than the blessings of the ancient mountains. And this is a huge idea. That what your parents have poured into you in terms of what they've said about you, what they've foretold, what they've told you about yourself, and the things they've poured into your life, they're stronger than the blessings of the mountains. And you know that. I mean, let's be honest, all of us are affected by our parents in profound ways for good or bad. Now, there's a, there's a different sermon that I'd like to preach in addition to the one I have this morning. And if I could have you here for an extra 30 minutes, I think I would do both of these sermons. But don't worry, I'm not going to do that. But in this other sermon, I would say this. Just because your father or mother poured into you a curse, they spoke words into you that were hurtful, you don't have to become what your mother or father said you would be. I want you to know that. And here's the thing, when you trust in God, God is going to break the power of the curse of the past and to take the curses and turn them into blessings. I have a friend of mine who's an exceptionally gifted pastor, compassionate, caring for people. He lived in a very abusive home when he was growing up. And in that abusive home, he was hurt physically. He was told by his father that he was nothing. But when he gave his life to Christ... He found that he was being told by God that he was somebody, that his life had value and had meaning. And God took the pain from his childhood and God transformed it. And as this young man was growing up, God gave him a pastor's heart. He gave him a heart of compassion and care for other people. And he made him into a remarkable pastor. And so God took the curses of his father and transformed them into a blessing. And I want you to know that God has the power to do that in your life too. I just want to make sure that you know that. What we want to talk about today is when parents are trying to bless their children and when they're trying to pour blessings into their children. And the question I want to ask you today is this, what blessings will you bestow upon the children in your life? Your kids, your grandkids, your nieces and nephews, the, the children here in Imagine Kids. But we need to understand this. Sometimes Parents seek to bless their children, but the blessings that they seek to give ultimately end up becoming curses. And this is a lesson that we've learned after all these years of, of parenting. I've learned them from these years of fathering. Sometimes what I thought I was doing to bless my children actually was potentially hurting them. And how I wish somebody had told me this early on, even though I somehow kind of knew. But there are three ways that I believe this happens at least. And I want to just share these with you briefly. The first one has to do with something that we value so much, and that is trying to be close to our children. We've come to measure ourselves by this, especially dads, because moms, I think, have, have always been able to do this. But, but dads weren't always measuring their success as a father based on how close they were to their kids. Because previous generations of dads weren't quite as involved in their kids' lives as parents are today. And so we think, if I'm close to to my kids, I'll be a good dad. And we want to be close to our children. It's a desire that's deep in our hearts. Richard Weisbord is a child psychologist, teaches at Harvard, and here's what he said. He wrote this. He said, American parents are engaged in a giant experiment. We're seeking a new kind of closeness with our children. Legions of fathers are trying, in contrast to their own fathers, to be far more involved in their children's daily lives attuned to their children's troubles and open to share with their children their own hopes and vulnerabilities. And I think that's a good thing. But here's where the challenge comes in. If you begin to believe that the most important mission as a father is to be close to your children and have your children be close to you, you may have forgotten what the real most important mission is. Because your mission as a father is to develop these children so that they grow up to know and to love God and so that they love their neighbor. So that they live with compassion and live just lives so that they're a servant and so they function well in society. That's really your job. But if you put that on the back burner and think, I need my kids to be close to me. Let's face it, you'll start doing some really stupid things. Do you remember that mom a while back who was arrested for, for buying alcohol for her kid's party? Why did she do that? 
Well, she said so her kids would think she was cool. So they'd be close to her. And so we forget the mission and we focus on having our kids be close to us. Now the strength, thing I've struggled with, I'm being honest, is not buying alcohol for my kids, obviously. But it's not been always holding fast to the boundaries and the discipline that we want for our children. And so when you really want to be close to your kids and you have this boundary or this rule and your daughter or son says to you, no other dad has that rule, or even worse, you hear that dreaded, you are the meanest dad in the whole world. Now, if you're judging your success as a dad on how close your kids are to you and your kid says you're the meanest dad in the world, then to you, you're a total failure. If that's your primary job to make your kids feel close to you, and then you start getting worn down. Do you know that feeling? And you start thinking, well, maybe I am the meanest dad in the whole world. And so you cave. And they start telling you that every kid gets to stay up late at night during the school week. Every kid except for me because of my dad. And you begin thinking, well, maybe I ought to let them stay up a little bit later. And so you struggle with that. And while you try to bless them by having them feel close to you, you might actually end up cursing them by not doing the things that would help them grow up to be healthy and responsible, to love God and to love their neighbors. A second way that we try to bless them but sometimes end up cursing our kids is this. We have this idea that our job as parents is to make our children happy. Do you buy into that? We want our kids to be happy. And so we do a lot to make them happy. And all of a sudden, that becomes the focus of that relationship. You're going to go out to eat as a family. And so you ask your kids, where do you want to go eat? I remember having those arguments. You want to go to this nice restaurant to eat, and they don't want to. They want McDonald's. And so we go to McDonald's instead of going to this other place. And how many times does the entire family change their plans because the, this kid wants to do one particular thing? You want to make them happy. So you get them a happy meal, right? And vacations. What do we do? We ask our six-year-old, where do you want to go on vacation? Even though they have no idea what things cost in different places. And so there's giving them things to make them happy because we want them to be happy. We want them to have anything they want. And then we can give it to them. We can afford to give it to them. And so we ask them, what do you want for your birthday? Well, what about this one? What do you want for Christmas? And then we get to the Christmas thing. And every year it's got to be something bigger than last year. We want to top last year. And the worst thing we think is for our kids to be disappointed at Christmas. And so we have this orgy of Christmas present opening. And by the time you get things done, the kids are tired. I mean, they're worn out from opening all the gifts. And how excited are they exactly about those last few presents? Often not very. But a lot of authors maintain that the more you try to make your kids happy, the less they are. Because you know this, part of the joy you get from, from something is working for it and struggling and sacrificing for it. But if you just get it, it fulfills a need for the moment, but not for long. And that's why a lot of teenagers are empty, even though their parents are trying to give them everything. And by the way, if you give your kids everything in their teenage years, what do they have to look forward to for the rest of their life? And in the end, you've not created kids who are, who are grateful and who are easily satisfied. You've created ungrateful, narcissistic people who believe the whole world revolves around their happiness. You didn't mean to create that. It just kind of happened in the process of you trying to give them everything because you wanted them to be happy, to give them everything you didn't have as a child. The last of the ways in trying to bless our children that can end up cursing them is trying to rescue them and saving them from any disappointment or adversity or pain or suffering. I didn't want Lauren and Jonathan to experience any hardship. I didn't want them to experience any pain or suffering or disappointment. And so in the midst of that, you have to ask yourself, well, how do you rescue them? Like if there's a child making fun of them at school, what do you do? You transfer them to another school. And sometimes those things may need to happen. I'm not saying you should never do that. The teacher's going to give them a bad grade. And you don't want your kid to get a bad grade. I mean, what could that do to their self-esteem? And so you get on the phone with the principal. And you say, you know what? I don't think it's my child's fault because my child is brilliant. If this was a better teacher, I think she'd know how to teach my child. 
My kid's going to get cut from the team. You can't cut my child from the team. That will just wreck his self-esteem. Tell you what, we'll buy the, the team uniforms if you just let my kids stay on the team. But here's the thing. When you're constantly protecting your children from disappointment and adversity and pain, in the end, you could actually end up hurting them. Here's what James says in his epistle in the New Testament. He says, Consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds, because the trials of your faith produce endurance and maturity. He goes on in the next verse. Now, if your children don't experience any trials, they're going to be missing out on endurance and maturity. Or Paul says, that suffering produces character and hope. So if you don't let your children experience any adversity or disappointment or pain, you may be robbing them of developing character or hope. Now remember I told you that this sermon is on two levels. It's about fathers and children, and it's about God and us. And I want you to ponder that for just a moment. Because all of these things that I just talked about begin to answer why God doesn't answer every single prayer that we ask. Or do everything we want Him to do. And why sometimes we have to go through hard things. It's because God is a Father who always gets it right. God doesn't want to curse us. He wants to bless us. And blessing us sometimes comes by withholding things from us instead of giving us everything that we ask for. Believe me, I know how hard parenting is. It's a struggle. Trying to figure out the right thing all the time. Are we being too strict? Are we not being strict enough? Are we giving them too much? Are we not giving them enough? It's hard to figure out. And I want you to hear this. Although there have been 75,000 books published on parenting, not one of those authors parent your children. And so it's hard to figure out how to do the right thing when it comes to being a parent. It was hard for your parents to figure out with you. And they struggle with the same things, no doubt. Let me let you in on a little secret. There are no perfect parents. Every parent wants to be a good parent, but there are no perfect parents. And I've watched kids grow up who grew up in homes that I thought were idyllic. Those parents got it as right as anybody I've ever seen, and their kids still had problems. And I've watched kids who grew up in very dysfunctional homes, and they turned out to be amazing. And so even when you try your best to get it right, you may not. And that's why one of the key ingredients of being a good parent is prayer. I mean, you can do the best you can. That's all God asks of you. You can do the best you can, and you pray a lot. And you say, God, help me, and make up for the deficiencies in my own parenting. Now, I want to take just a couple more minutes, and I want to switch gears and mention the life changes or life transitions that happen naturally with kids. From the time they are babies until they grow up. Here's what I learned. I, I really believe there are three distinct life phases for children. The first one starts at birth and goes through somewhere between the fifth and eighth grades. And during this phase, life is wonderful. I mean, it is absolutely awesome being a daddy. It's not without its challenges. I mean, I know there's colic and there are ear infections and your, your kid bites another kid in the nursery. I, I know those things happen. But you are your children's hero. And it's a pretty heady thing to be some little girl's or some little boy's hero. And when Lauren was little, she used to always say to me, Daddy, I want to marry you someday. And it wasn't creepy. It was just sweet. You know what I mean? And we'd go out in public and my kids would hold my hands. And all these things are just the most wonderful things, wonderful experiences that you could have. And then something happens. And it is weird. And it happens overnight. You can put the next slide up. There it is. You can be a hero one day and a zero the next. I knew everything and then I knew nothing. They couldn't wait to see me. And then all of a sudden one day they didn't want to see me for anything. And you wonder, what did I do? What did I do? I'm the same guy I've always been. And they can go around and be irritated. They can be sometimes angry. And I could not for the life of me figure it out. It was one of the hardest things I've ever experienced. And people would tell me, hey, it's going to be okay. Just hang on. Just keep loving them through this. They'll come out on the other side and they're going to turn back to you. And I was thinking, yeah, your kids did, but mine probably won't. I mean, they're going to hate me forever and I don't even know what I did. But then the, the third phase, once they moved out from home, it was pretty amazing again. I mean, my IQ immediately shot back, way back up and we began to establish a relationship again. So I think those are the three life phases. 
you start and it's idyllic. And then it turns into this crazy, confusing, sometimes painful time. And then you move into this last phase. And if you continue to try to love them during the hard times, the time will come when they will turn back. And it is, it is really cool when they do. Lauren and Jonathan are now adults. And I could not be prouder of them for the young woman and young man that they have become. And you know the story. Now we are so blessed to have this third child, Joshua, who came into our lives a number of years ago. We adopted him from the Philippines. Josh is nine. He grows up with all the other imagined kids here at Imagine Church. And it's a joy to me to think that all of these kids are going to grow up together in this church. So nobody move, okay? We want our kids to be able to grow up together. But it's my hope and it's my prayer that even after I'm someday gone from this earth and in heaven, that Lauren and Jonathan and Joshua will all realize, you know, my daddy loved me an awful lot. I think that's the hope that all of us have as fathers. And that's the power. That's the power of a blessing. You see the power of a blessing? To pour a blessing into someone else's life, into a child's life. How it changes themselves, how it changes the world for them when you pour that blessing in. So don't ever give up on your kids, even during the toughest of times. You just keep trying. You hold on. You keep praying. And just believe that somehow they're going to come out all right on the other side. So let me end by asking this question. If the blessings of a parent are stronger than the blessing of the ancient mountains, then what kind of blessing do you want to pour into your child? And part of what you have to think about is this. When they are grown, what is my vision? for what they will be as adults. And then I have to reach back and ask myself, what do I need to pour in them now to realize that vision then? And so you've got to ask yourself the really hard question of, what is the point of human existence? What is the goal so that I can raise my kids to experience that? I know there are different answers, but for me, the answer to that question is found in Jesus' words. It is to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Those are the most important things in my life. And so that's what I want to give to my children. I want them to be someone who grows up to love God and love their neighbor. I'm reminded of what the book of Proverbs says. It says, start children off the way they should go. And even when they are old, they will not turn away from it. Did you catch that? It didn't say when they are a teenager, they will not turn from it. It says, and when they are old, they will not turn from it. Here's what you can count on. During those times when your kids are struggling with their faith, you try to help them see why your faith is important to you. Try to answer the questions you can and continue to pray for them over and over and over again and then give them some space too. And in the process of that, somehow our kids have a way of figuring it out in the end that all the stuff they learned when they were kids and what they saw in you as their mom and dad is really true. Jacob said to his son Joseph, the blessings of a father, and I could add, and a mother, a grandmother, or grandfather, are stronger than the blessing of the ancient mountains. What are the blessings? What are the blessings that you will give a child? If you don't get off that Xbox, I will make sure you never play it again. Listen, if you don't settle down and go to bed, you can sleep outside tonight. Little girls who aren't grateful don't get any presents at Christmas.
any of these clothes that are still on the floor in 10 minutes are going to be given to someone who really needs them. You come home late one more time, you won't have a car. Stop fighting or I'm turning this car around right now. I want to thank you for the way that you support the life and mission and outreach of Imagine Church. We do more in the world than you may realize and next Sunday we'll have a chance to talk a little more about what we do in mission in the world. That's all because of what you give through your prayer and your devotion, through your participation, your attendance, but also through your giving. And God takes those gifts that you give and multiplies them by His grace and accomplishes His holy work in the world. I thank you on behalf of the entire church family, but more importantly, on behalf of the kingdom of God for what you give and for what your offering makes possible. We're going to prepare now for a time of offering as our praise team sings. wonder if you'll be generous as you give again as you have so faithfully over the weeks and months. Let's bow our heads and pray together. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the way that you love us. We know that you love us not because we're so valuable, but we are valuable because you love us so much. And because of that great love, O oh God, we want to give back to you who has given so much to us. And so from the bounty of your creation and the goodness of your hand, we have so much. Accept what we give today and use it to accomplish your mission and work in the world. Bless the gifts and bless the givers, we pray. And all this we ask in Jesus' holy name and for his sake. Amen. Like a ring of solid gold, like a vow that is tested, love and never Your love is near through the winter rain and beyond the horizon. Your making me 
Thank you, Mike, and thank you, band. We bow our heads and pray together. Let's offer prayer. God, we pray that you'll give us wisdom to guide our children. Help us to learn what to give and and what to withhold. Show us when to reprimand and when to praise. God, make us gentle and considerate. And help us to know when to be firm and watchful. We pray that you'll keep us from weak indulgence or great severity. That you'll give us the courage to sometimes be disliked by our children. When we must do necessary things that might be displeasing to them. But God, give us all the virtues we need to lead them by word and by example in the paths of righteousness. And Lord, forgive us for the ways that we have failed. And we pray that by your Spirit, that you would make up for our deficiencies. God, take care of our children. Help them to know you and to love you and to follow you. And to be the human beings that you desire for them to be. And help us always as Imagine Church. To love children well. We pray this in your holy name. And all of us together said, Amen. As we go into our closing song, we want to thank Matt Donato for such an amazing addition to our praise team. So thank you, Matt, for being here today. And uh, I know that Pastor Bruce says that uh, jokingly Lauren gets his uh, her musical ability from him. But I don't know if you know our pastor played drums, so you never know. Past life, that past time. Let's stand this morning and sing, uh, join our voices and sing this awesome message. It is a great message as we go out into the world. Lord, we're yours and we are here to do your work. It's not always easy. You just lead us and guide us, find our minds and open our hearts to how to do this well. With our hearts open minds, we will do this. The sacrifice we bring. Sing with us this morning. With these hearts, open wide. From the depths, from the heights, I will bring a sacrifice. With these hands lifted high, hear my song, hear my cry, I will bring.
your will, your way, it will be my joy to say. Your will, your way, it will be my joy to say. Your will, your way, always. Let's sing that one more time. It will be my joy to say. Your will, your way. Your way, it will be my joy to say. Your will, your way, always. I love our last song because it stays with me throughout the rest of the week, doesn't it, for you? I'm so proud of our praise team for the way that they honor God with their service. Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you, team, for the music this morning. I want to share with you an example of how God works because this week, Kelly Link, along with her daughter Shayla and one of our other children, Sydney Walker, went around in our neighborhood, the landing, and put little mailbox flyers in the mailbox. And somebody who just moved here from Texas, her name is Sherry, and she's here today, saw that and came to Imagine Church today. That's the way it works in the kingdom of God. It's one person sharing with another person. And Sherry, we welcome you. We're so glad you're here today. I was at a uh, soccer tournament yesterday with Joshua down in Lexington, South Carolina. This woman came up to me and she said, you're the pastor whose picture is on that mailbox fire. We live in Oakton. Well, somebody, I think it was Lydia Smith did the same thing in Oakton and, and Herring Cove, delivered those little mailbox flyers. We have lots more mailbox flyers. If any of you want to take the hint and give them out in your neighborhood, you let us know. We'd be happy for you to do that. One couple that I'm so fond of, I did their wedding a few years ago down at uh, Oak Island near Wilmington, and they've just had such a delightful life together. Justin and Anna are here today. Justin just took a job. They've lived down in South Carolina, and Justin's working now in Charlotte. They're moving here. Anna's getting a job here. Uh, maybe with one of you, because she single-handedly ran Clemson University the last few years. I mean, they could not have done it without her, but now they're moving up here, and we're glad to have them as a new part of Imagine Church, and Penny is with them, their mother. We're glad you're here too, Penny, and we look forward to when you get moved and settled here and can be a part of Imagine Church. Next week, we continue our, our parenting, our series called The Family, and we're going to look at mothering, and we've got some great people who are going to be helping with that, so be here next week, and then on October 1st, we'll wrap up this series. And our missionary is going to be with us. Nika is a missionary in Southeast Asia in Nepal. And we help provide support for her and her new husband, Nick. They're going to be here. We'll have a chance to meet them that Sunday. They'll share briefly in worship. And then we'll have a reception for them following worship. And then we believe on October 15th, Lauren Magney will be here uh, to sing in worship a couple songs. And then that evening to provide a concert for St. John Relief. So be mindful of these upcoming dates. Thank you, uh, Kim and Susan, for being our host team today. And we've got refreshments that are still left, so don't be in any hurry to leave. And about 11.45, in about 15 minutes, we're going to begin the Pastor's Life Group. Meets in this room right here to my left, your right. We meet until about uh, 12, about 1.15. We'll finish by 1.15, promise. So you'll be home for the Panthers game. But we have a light lunch together, and we have a t chance to look at some church history and, and also at the Bible and just share a little bit of life with each other. And we pray, and then we go home. So stick around for that life group if you'd like. We'd love to have you be a part of that. Would you pray this prayer after me? Lord Jesus, we love you. And we go now to serve you. Amen.